As you're being seated, go ahead and get your Bibles out. And turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 7 in 1 Timothy 3. If you are using the Bible in the back of the pew in front of you, then you can find 1 Timothy chapter 3 beginning on page 932 of that Bible. If this is your first time with us, then for the last several weeks, we have been taking a break from our walk through the Gospel of Luke, and we have been focusing our attention on the church. Ephesians 5 tells us that Jesus Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And so we've been thinking about what the church is. How should it order itself? How should we live together as members inside of it? And this morning, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at leadership in the church. Jesus Christ, as we've been talking about and as we've been singing about, is our great captain. He is the author and the perfecter of our salvation. He went before us to accomplish and to lead us into the victory of the freedom of the sons of God. But the Bible also tells us that Jesus, our great captain and shepherd, has also called on men to serve as his under shepherds and rally his people and lead them into that victory. Jesus Christ is the great head of the church, the great leader of the church, the great king, and yet as king, he has seen fit to call on men to serve as pastors, leaders, overseers, elders, the Bible uses all of these different words, to lead his people. So what I wanna do this morning, usually I, I, I want to, to speak to everybody and in some sense I wanna do that, but my particular attention this morning and the ones to whom I want to specifically direct these words is the men here this morning. The church does well. The church is at its best. The church functions best when it has godly men who are leading the church with love and with passion and with humility. The pattern of churches throughout the whole New Testament from the book of Acts to Philippians to Ephesians to Timothy all over, the pattern of churches is not just one person leading a whole church, but really a whole group of godly men who make it their aim to lovingly lead and shepherd and guide the church. We should not think of church leadership or even the work of pastoring as the work of just one person. But we should, as a church, long and desire to see many men, as many men as want to and are able and are qualified to lead and serve and shepherd a congregation. And so I want this morning to be a call to our men to aspire to be the kind of men that can lead and do good to God's church. There are too many churches in the world, too many churches in the country where the men are weak and passive. And we need to have godly, strong, ambitious, mature, humble, hungry men who are willing to take on the burden and the responsibility of lovingly leading and guiding and caring for God's people. So men, I'm issuing a direct challenge to you all this morning to be men of God, to not be afraid of the work of leading and shepherding people into the victory that Jesus Christ, our King, has purchased for us. And these words here in 1 Timothy 3 tell us what these kinds of men should look like. So it may not be God's calling on your life. It may not be your gifting and skill set and ability to be a vocational pastor. In fact, that's going to be very few of us. But I believe with all my heart that God wants to raise up men in our church to be strong, godly leaders 
who are not afraid of the challenge of being under shepherds with the Lord Jesus to care for and guide and rally his people. And these verses tell us what those men need to look like. So let's hear these words together. First Timothy chapter three, verses one through seven. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Father, I pray as we look together at these characteristics this morning, as we think about the kinds of men that we want to have, we'd be blessed to have to serve as leaders in our church. Father, I pray that you would stir within the hearts of our men a desire a want to, to love and care for your people. Father, give us men who are like this. Bless us with men who want to be like this and help us to find places and get them in positions where they can serve and oversee and teach and shepherd this congregation. Father, we ask and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Paul here is he's giving us a list of qualifications, a list of qualities that the men who lead in the church should have. And they can be summarized really in two things. Is they are men with ambition combined with character. Men of ambition who have character. Well, let's look at those two things together. The very first characteristic that is clear that they must have is these are men who have godly ambition. In other words, they should want to lead. They should aspire to lead. They should long to have a position where they can lead and shepherd and care for other people. Paul uses two words here to describe these men. He says, the saying is trustworthy. He says, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Now those two words, aspire and the word for desire, they communicate a strong longing to do something. In fact, most of the time that these two words are used in the Bible, they describe sinful desire meaning it's a strong thing that it's hard to resist. So these are men who want to. They have a deep longing to shepherd and to oversee and to be responsible for God's people. God only wants those leading in the church who deeply desire to lead. I think it can be tempting for us to think of ambition as a bad thing. But Paul makes it very clear, it's not a bad thing to want to lead something. It's not a bad thing to want to be upfront. It's not a bad thing to want to say, I'll take responsibility for you all. Come on, go where I'm going. Now, obviously that kind of ambition needs to be met with the character, which he goes on to talk about in the rest of the list. But there should be a desire to want to lead. 
I think sometimes it's the case, and certainly this was the counsel that was given to me. When I was growing up in the church and I was thinking about becoming a pastor, people gave me advice like, Dustin, do anything else that you can possibly do. If you can do anything else, do that. Only after you've tried to do any other thing you can do, only then should you give in and be a pastor. And I, I get the thought behind that counsel. I, I think there's some wisdom in it. But I read Paul here saying, if anyone aspires, if anybody desires to do the work, he wants to do a noble thing. I don't hear Paul discouraging, hey, do anything but be a pastor. Do anything but be a leader. I, I hear him saying, no, you got some brothers that want to do that? That's a good thing. That's a noble thing that it is that they want to do. I think unintentionally, there is, and I think good natured, this resistance against men who want to be up front and be strong men. I think sometimes we overemphasize nice guys to the detriment of cultivating strong guys. I would much rather try to rein somebody in than try to get them going. You know what I'm saying? I would much rather have to say, hey, whoa, easy, let's, let's pull back on the brakes on that a little bit then to try to drum up and get people moving. I'd much rather do that. I think we have more of an ambition problem than we do an arrogance problem. I think we have too many men who are content to just be nice church-going guys and not enough men who burn within their hearts to lead and to take a church someplace. I don't think we have enough men who deeply and earnestly aspire to be leaders. And when I read here in 1 Timothy 3, 1, I see that we should be encouraging men to develop a passion to lead because strong, ambitious leaders in the church are too few and far between. One pastor put it this way. He said, can you imagine the Christ-exalting power of a church filled with men possessing a strong, godly desire to lead Christ's sheep in their homes and their church? He says, in my experience, the problem in many churches falls at the other end of the spectrum. Most men aspire for little more than comfort, anonymity, ease, and just about anything else except leadership responsibility. I think we have too many men who are content to just simply come in to church and worship, but not get their hands dirty helping a church get someplace. And we need men with that kind of ambition men who are willing to serve. We have plenty of men who long to have influence in the business world. We have plenty of men who long to have influence on rec league sports fields. We have plenty of men who long to have influence in the money they make or the success they have or the comfort that they've earned. But we have too few men willing to lay down their lives for the sake of the church. Too few men who are willing to sacrifice and order their lives around serving and beautifying the church for which Christ Jesus died. I believe wholeheartedly that the church, not just this church, but all churches across America, across the world, I believe that the church needs men with ambition. We need men with fire in their eyes. We need men with love in their hearts. We need men with the glory of God as the motor of their souls. We need men who are not afraid to wake up early, who are willing to stay up late, who will earn less money at work, who will cut vacations short, men who are dependable, who are reliable, men who ask how much they can serve, not how much is required. Men who will do what they say even when it hurts them to carry it out so that they can encourage the saints because their heart is captivated by the glory of the church. 
I believe that we need a lot more lions in the church and a lot less cats. And that's no offense to cat people. But we need lions. We need men who are willing to put themselves square in the middle of Satan's crosshairs, who burn in their souls to do whatever it takes to see Christ's glory prevail, to see the church strengthened, men who will not afraid to think dip, deeply and serve humbly and will treat that as a joy and not a duty. The church is gonna flourish when we have men like that. So brothers, I'm challenging you, get some ambition. Put your life on the line. Don't be afraid to put yourself in Satan's crosshairs because if you lead, you will. If you want to lead, you will be criticized. If you want to lead, you will be opposed. If you want to lead, your life will get harder. If you want to lead, you will sleep less and you will worry more but you're doing that for the sake of the bride for which Christ died. Rec league trophies rust and get forgotten. Money is lost or given to somebody else. Whatever position or title you might hold at work, someday somebody else is gonna hold it but the glory of the church of Jesus Christ is forever. So give me some men with ambition to lead it and to lead it with all their hearts. Ambition, ambition, but it's ambition with character. The want to is not enough. There also has to be the desire to shape and order your life to be the kind of man who can lead with that kind of ambition and not do great harm to the church. Because ambition without godliness is dangerous. And a desire to lead without a commitment to character is destructive. So we don't just need ambition, we need ambition with also the commitment to cultivate a godly life. Paul says here that those who aspire, who desire to lead, to oversee, to pastor, to shepherd, to take responsibility for other people, it's a noble, worthy task. Therefore, because it's noble and worthy, they must be men of high character. He says that they must be above reproach. That doesn't mean certainly that they're perfect. It doesn't mean that they don't fall or stumble in some ways, but it does mean that there cannot be anything in his life that people inside or outside of the church would say makes that person unfit to lead. They must be exemplary, not perfect, but exemplary in their character. And he goes on to list what above reproach looks like. So above reproach is a general description and the rest of the list shows what above reproach means. So he goes on to list several qualities that I've grouped together, hopefully for help of organization into five categories, five categories of character that a leader must be. And so brothers, these are five categories of character that I'm calling you to live out. Be this kind of man so that when you get the ambition from God, you can be the kind of person to lead. Five characteristics. Number one, you must be completely devoted to your wife. So that's just one characteristic, but I'm giving it its own category because it's so very important. Paul says that he must be the husband of one wife and literally what he says is he must be a man of one woman. Whoever wants to lead in the church must be completely devoted to his woman. And by completely devoted, I mean completely devoted. Mind, heart, body, hands, 
emotions, affections. They must all be centered on one woman. If you were to ask a pastor, a leader, a shepherd, what woman is first in your mind when you wake up in the morning and when you go to sleep at night? What woman makes your heart beat faster? What woman excites your entire body to its greatest passion? What woman has your deepest emotional friendship connection? What woman arouses your affections? His answer to every one of those questions must be, well, there's just one. And that's my wife. You all, how many times has this one qualification disqualified so many? Seems like this year has almost been week after week, month after month, we're hearing of another pastor falling. Just a couple weeks ago, there was a pastor that maybe some of you, many of you listened to his sermons. He was a stalwart in conservative, evangelical, Bible-based, glory of God type ministry. And yet for five years, while he was preaching, while he was teaching, while he was speaking at conferences, while he was shepherding a church, for five years, he kept up an adulterous relationship with a woman 50 years younger than him. I met with a group of pastors this week and a brother who has been in ministry for 50 years told me that in his 50 years, he could likely name over 100 pastors who have failed in this area. They must be men of faithfulness. And the first place of faithfulness is to his wife, is to one woman. And I love how Paul lists his qualification. So there's a lot, of, a lot of ways that he could have said this to put the focus on different aspects. He could have said, okay, to lead, you've got to be sexually pure. Okay, to lead, you've got to be free from sexual immorality. He could have listed it as sins that you stay away from that you're not guilty of, but he doesn't describe it through the lens of what you're supposed to stay away from, but what you're supposed to be devoted to. This is a man who is sexually faithful because he is so devoted to his wife. Because he is a man of one woman, because everything about him just gets excited and aroused and brought up and gladdened and brought joy by one woman, because that is the passion of his heart, he's free from these other things. We fight best against what we wanna run away from by focusing most on what we wanna be devoted to. And this man is like that. He's devoted to his wife, but so much more so than just sexual faithfulness. He's devoted to her in his humility. He's devoted to her in his service. He puts himself last. He does whatever is necessary for her joy. He puts down his preferences. This is what I always tell the young men who come to Beth and I for counseling before they get married. When we talk about marriage and the husband's role, we just tell them, right, Jake, just a couple weeks ago, from now on for the rest of your life, you're last. If it does not have to do with faithfulness to God, you do what she wants to do. Christ laid down his life for the church. Husbands should lay down their lives. So when it's movie time, watch what she wants to watch. When we're going to lunch, go where she wants to go. When you're talking about how you wanna arrange the couches in the living room, arrange them the way she wants them to be arranged. We, all, we lay ourselves down completely devoted to her benefit. Pastors must be men like this. Not just a man who can control his sexual urges, but a man who is so devoted to one woman above all others that it shapes his whole life. Second qualification. He must be committed to self-denial. 
In other words, he must be able to tell himself no. He must be able to have control over his desires and deny himself for higher and better purposes. He must be able to face sinful desires or desires for things that aren't necessarily sinful but aren't the greatest good and say no to to them so that he can pursue what is best. Under this heading, I'm grouping several of the qualifications. Paul says that he has to be sober-minded, meaning that he doesn't allow himself to be clouded and distracted by things of lesser importance. He must be self-controlled. He can't be a drunkard. He can't be a lover of money. He knows when enough is enough and can stop when it's wise to do so. He can tell himself no. This is one of the reasons why when we're training and pouring into next generation leaders here at the church, one of the things that we take them through is we make sure that they know how to fast. If you don't eat for a whole day or two days or or however long, you're having to tell yourself no a lot, especially if you're used to eating every two hours like most people are. You have to practice. Here comes an urge. It's an urge I would normally say yes to, and I'm going to practice saying no. We build that into them because self-denial, being self-controlled, being clear-headed, saying no to yourself is like a muscle you have to work just like anything else. It gets stronger the more that you do it. The more you say no, the more you're able to say no. And a pastor should be somebody who is so practiced at saying no to himself, that he's sober-minded, self-controlled, doesn't get drunk, is not constantly chasing after money. He's committed to self-denial. Number three, He has to devote himself to other people. Devote himself to other people. These are brothers whose lives are not lived for themselves, but they so order and they structure their lives so that they live to the benefit of other people. Paul says that the church leader must be honorable meaning that he has a concern for how others evaluate his life. He doesn't want to fall into disgrace or into Satan's snare, the snare of temptation that other people can look at and find fault. He makes sure that there's nothing in his life that people can point to and say, well, see, look at that. Paul says that he must be hospitable, which means that he shows love and kindness to people who can't do anything for him. He says that he has to be able to teach And anybody who has ever undertaken the task to teach, no, it takes work. It's difficult. It takes time. You have to take time to understand what it is that you're teaching. And you have to take time to understand the people that are going to be listening to it. And then you have to take time to think about, well, what's the most effective way to get this over here to them? It's difficult. It's hard. I hope you all constantly send thank yous to your D group leaders and your family Bible study teachers. I get paid to be here this morning, you know? And those folks are teaching and leading you for free. And it takes time. You gotta devote yourself to the good of other people. Paul says that this man cannot be a bully. He cannot insist on his own way. He has to, you have to be able to work with him. He has to take other people's perspectives and not always insist on getting what he wants. He must be gentle with other people. He must try to bring people together and work peace and try to bridge gaps and divides. He's not difficult to deal with. He doesn't like to fight. He doesn't wanna be at odds with other people. He strives to work out differences and bring peace. He's devoted his life to the good of other people. He's not just ambitious and loving his wife and being self-controlled for his own benefit. When you look at the calendar and the schedule of his life, especially how he uses his free time, you see it filled with things that he would not do if he were not serving other people and living for their benefit. Number four, 
The brother needs to be able to lead other people. He has to be able to take people places and have a track record for leading other people well. I get this from the qualification that he says in verse four that the leader must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. So he's got to be able to lead his children to live in the right way, but with all dignity. So there's multiple ways that you can get your children to behave and not all of them are dignified. You can get your children to behave by terrifying them Or you can lead them to behave because they love you and they respect you and they want to live in a way that's pleasing to you. I don't think the requirement to keep your household well automatically disqualifies brothers who don't have children from leading because if that was the case, then Paul couldn't be a pastor. Timothy, he's not married, he doesn't have children and Jesus himself would be disqualified. But it has to be the case that if they don't have children, you look at the areas where they lead, are people following them? Do they respect them? Look at the class that he teaches and the D group he leads. What kinds of people are in those classes? What are those he disciples? What do they look like? Does he lead them well? And in the final category, they must have deep humility. Is he willing to fight against pride in his life? Paul says in verse six that he must not be a recent convert, but then he tells us why. If he's a recent convert, then he may become puffed up with conceit and then fall into the condemnation of the devil. It was pride that the devil appeared to in Adam and Eve to get them to disobey God and to fall into condemnation. And so this person who would lead must be humble. Power that's given to immaturity often leads to pride. So a person needs to demonstrate that they are a humble person, that they're willing to take on hard tasks, that they're willing to do the small things, the little things, the non-glorious things in order to help other people. He's humble. So guys, Paul says these are the five things that we need to be if we want to be leaders. These are the five things that we should aspire to be. We should aspire to be faithful and devoted to our wives, to deny ourselves, to devote ourselves to other people, to lead well, and to be humble. That's the kind of men that the church needs. That's the kind of man that God wants you to be. But really, we could shrink these five characteristics down to really just one. And that is, we need men who will follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need men who are willing to do what it takes to be like Jesus. Who else is more devoted to his bride than the Lord Jesus Christ? Jesus loved the church as his bride. He gave himself up for her to make her spotless, to clothe her with glory. He emptied himself and made himself nothing for the sake of his bride. Who else was more committed to self-denial than the Lord Jesus Christ? Jesus is God himself, and yet he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant. Who else is more devoted to others than the Lord Jesus Christ? Jesus is the glorious son of man, and yet he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Who is a better leader than the Lord Jesus Christ? Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith for the joy set before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and we live our lives best when we keep our eyes fixed on him. And who else is humble like the Lord Jesus Christ? He was not ashamed to be despised and rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
And so to say that we need men to be leaders in our church, ambition with character, what we're really saying is we need men who will answer to call to be like the Lord Jesus Christ and are not afraid to put themselves in harm's way to rally his people to follow his example. I'll leave you with this story. In the movie Glory, about a regiment in the Civil War, the final scene of that movie is a final battle. And there's an objective, a fort that needs to be taken. It's an uphill climb, it's dangerous. And all the men are huddled down at the bottom of the fort, just waiting, shivering, waiting for someone to take the first step to seize the objective. Well, it's at that moment that the leader of the troops, Colonel Robert Shaw, he stands up by himself on his own and starts to run up the hill, knowing that he's gonna have to give his life to do it. He blazes, he's the first one that goes. But after he marches up the hill and he is, of course, shot through with many bullets, he falls down dead and none of the people move. None of the other soldiers follow his example. It's not until other men from the regiment stand up themselves. It's not until they stand up, not just their leader, but their brothers, that they stand up and they pick up the flag and they turn around to everybody else and say, come on, let's go. Well, Jesus Christ has walked up that hill for us first. But we need men and brothers who will look at his church and say, come on, let's go. Let's follow his example. Let's walk with him. When those brothers stood up and they took up the flag and they followed that example, that's when the troop, they all stood up with a battle cry and said, let's go. And they stormed on the mission. Guys, we need men like that in our church. You're gonna get hit with bullets. You're gonna fall. It's gonna be difficult. It's not gonna be comfortable. But we need a few good men who are not afraid to stand up and put themselves in the crosshairs of the enemy, following the example of Jesus and saying, come on, let's go. Is God calling you to be a man like that? Where do you need to grow? Where do you need to step up? Where do you need to be a man and lead for the glory of God? for the good of his people. If anyone aspires to do that work, he desires a good thing. Father, I pray that you would raise up men like this in our church. What strength, what power, what encouragement would there be if we can point to all these men and say, I'm following them. They're leading me. I see his life. I see his ambition. I see his character. I see how he's pointing me to the Lord Jesus. What a place, what a power, what a mission we could accomplish if you, God, would multiply men like that in this congregation. Father, help us to answer the call to be men willing to lead, to take responsibility, to be the under shepherds following the chief shepherd. Father, would you convict us and would you make us men of ambition and character? And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.